So I'm going to talk about LiDAR mapping technology, especially as applied to mapping the Earth's surface. Um, as a, a working GIS analyst, LiDAR DEMs are wonderful things. They're, they're, they're detailed, quantitative descriptions of the Earth's surface that speak to almost everybody, and they fit easily into a GIS work environment. Um, that's not what I'm going to talk about this morning. Dave's going to touch on that a little bit later. I'm going to talk about where these DEMs come from and, and what to think about as, as we use them. Um, LiDAR that we use in a GIS for seeing near surface is an airborne, is a form of airborne remote sensing. You put a laser rangefinder that scans back and forth across the ground, looking beneath a small plane as it flies back and forth. We use a high-end GPS, the best stuff we can buy, what surveyors use, to locate the aircraft in the sky above the Earth. We also use the most expensive uh, inertial measurement unit, or digital gyroscope we can afford, to tell which way the aircraft is pointing. We look at the scanning apparatus and see what its angles are. And then we use a laser rangefinder to measure the distance from the aircraft to the ground. And we can do that 100,000 times a second. And um, if we add up the position from the GPS, the orientation from the IMU and the scanner, and the distance from the laser rangefinder, we can get a XYZ coordinates in the reference system of your choice for the target on the ground. And we can do this, um, say, 100,000 times a second and make millions and millions of measurements per square mile. Make very, very dense, accurate descriptions of the Earth's surface. And that's really what you need to know about LIDAR. Um, to look at one of these instruments uh, in the real world, uh, it's a, a laser and a telescope and a scanning apparatus in this box. This box is this one, this one scale, scale. Um, and a whole lot of whole electronics, lot of both power supply, GPS, IMU, and computers. And this rack is sitting behind the instrument operator um, in the cabin of the single engine aircraft. And the telescope, the apparatus is looking down through a hole in the floor. Um, by operating one of these systems, we generate a point cloud, a bunch of X, Y, Z positions out there in space um, that describe the Earth and things on the Earth beneath the airplane. Um, this view in green and brown, circles and X's, um, is a piece of a point cloud, a vertical slice through a point cloud across a small valley west of Mount Rainier. Um, and I think you can pick out in here the trees. And also the, the lower limit of the point cloud, which is the ground surface, and the valley bottom is down in here. We come back up. Um, in forested terrain like most of western Washington, Typically, 90% of the measurements you make are of the forest canopy. And if you want to know what forest looks like, this is an exquisite data set. Uh, I don't. And so I'm going to ignore the forest for the most part in the rest of this talk. Uh, but know that the LIDAR mapping maps more than the surface of the Earth. And if you're a geomorphologist, the other stuff is, is noise to be gotten rid of. But that noise is someone else's data. And it's very, very useful data. And if you want to count trees, measure trees, uh, Look at the area of buildings, look at impervious surface on roofs, whatever. LIDAR is a great data set. The use of that in a GIS is a little bit more complicated. Um, so as a geomorphologist, a geologist, I want to know what the ground looks like, and I've got a data set that's 90% not ground. And that raises problems when the, the data set is composed of times literally billions of points, most commonly merely millions. Um, so we need some sort of automated process to, to tell us what's ground and what's not. And there are many kinds of algorithms you can use to look at a point cloud and say what's ground and what's not. I'm going to show you one of these to point out this is a tractable problem. You can do this in the computer with fairly good results. If we look at a, an idealized earth with idealized trees um, with LIDAR positions, things the laser measured on the earth and trees, um, we can see we've got a point cloud. We can connect the dots. And in profile like this, it's drawing a jagged line. In, in 3D real world, it's building a tin. You can flag the points that are sharp upward convexities. Identify those by code, identify them, delete them from the data set, and rebuild the jagged line, or rebuild the tin. And repeat the process. And after a few cycles, you end up with a fairly good approximation of the Earth's surface, a, a bare Earth surface model. We can automate this. We can fly the plane in a fairly systematic fashion for $500 a square mile, 
and process the data and make descriptions that cover all of Western Washington or all the Puget Lowland. Um, this is of an area near around including Belfair at the head of Hood Canal um, in the red box over in the lower right side. And on the right side of the image, the trees have been taken off digitally. On the left side, they're left on. The image has been colored by very simple rules in a GIS environment. Um, if it's ground surface, you know, use a color ramp. If it's below zero, call it blue. Um, if it's not ground, if we're points that are above the ground here, I've used the first return surface, the highest hit surface. Um, if they're high, color them dark, if dark green. If they're low, color them light green. And you get a near photographic image that has a depth, a perspective, shadows that are very difficult to capture in a photograph that allow you to see, for example, that this area in here, including Norm Dix's summer home, is a big landslide. And that helped fund a lot of these surveys. And <laughs> that, well, we funded the surveys first with Norm Dix's help. And, and we learned something useful and we happy to keep funding them. Um, and then above here, we see this, this break across through here um, is probably an active fault trace. Um, there's some discussion because we can't completely rule out the possibility it's actually a head scarf of a really, really big landslide. Um, and then what else in here? Highway 303. Um, you have the railroad tracks that take the nukes to Bangor, and here are big box stores in um, Belfair. And lots of funny artifacts out in the water. We'll come back to water in a minute. This system works really well. They're, the high uh, inherent accuracy and precision. Um, the raw LIDAR measurements, um, we can measure the distances routinely with good calibration down to about plus or minus two centimeters, this little. Um, it's harder to measure which way the aircraft is pointing. So we can measure where the aircraft is also very well. It's harder to measure which way the pitch roll in the yaw of the aircraft, um, the scanner angle on the instrument we can calibrate that we still have to add in the pitch roll in the yaw of the aircraft, that's harder to do. And so typically we see X, Y errors where this thing is on the ground out there below us that are on the order of 20 centimeters. Um, if you're on flat ground, that's not a big, you know, moving things side to side, it's still flat and still in the same place. If you get into steep ground, 100% slope, X, Y error is translated to Z error, one to one. And so in steep ground, um, the accuracy of our heights degrades considerably. Um, the other thing is in the earth sciences, um, we use a bare earth DEM, and which is a continuous surface, a model built from the measured points. And the error in the DEM is more than just the error in the point measurements. It's also the error in the identification of which returns are ground and which ones are not ground. And it's the error introduced by interpolating from scattered points to a continuous surface. And we don't have routinely available better surface models to compare LIDAR DEMs with. So we don't know routinely what the accuracy of those surface models is. Um, we can estimate it by looking at the internal reproducibility of the LIDAR survey. We're surveying in swaths and fly back and forth. Every swath overlaps its neighbor. We can look at a subset of the data that's one swath, compare it to subsets of the next swath, and ask how reproducible is that surface DEM. Um, the, the whole data cloud DEM will be better because it's got more points in it and less interpolation error. But we can still get an idea. And from that, uh, my experience is that with well-done LIDAR, in flat open ground, we get surface models that look like they have absolute accuracies of a few centimeters in flat open ground, parking lots. Those are easy targets. If we get into heavily wooded ground, where many of the LIDAR beams are intercepted by trees and never reach the ground, uh, where we aren't sure what's tree and what's ground, and where the translation of XY error to Z error is a problem, um, reproducibility is typically a foot or less in these are not that good. These are still much better than any other alternative source of elevation data. Um, I've been talking about commercial mapping LIDAR, which might be better described as ALFM, or Airborne Laser Swath Mapping, um, which is characterized by being airborne, working at heights of about a kilometer, 3,000 feet off the ground. Our swath widths are hundreds of meters, depending on how we set our scanner. Um, we use a near-infrared laser, uh, just barely into the infrared, 1,064 nanometers. 
and we use a pulse detector, um, which is a combination of, of hardware and firmware in the instrument, that turns a continuous waveform of incoming light, variable intensity, into discrete pulses that correspond to where most of the reflections are happening. And this simplifies the process of, of building and operating and using the data, instrument using the data. There are, however, other flavors of LiDAR. Ten years ago, if you Googled LiDAR, what you got were mostly hits on LiDAR as used by atmospheric scientists, which is a laser bolted to a rooftop looking upwards, in one direction, no scanner. And they could use this to tell where's the dust in the air, what height, where's the fog. And doing atmospheric profile, and it's an effective technology still used. That's been overwhelmed by applications of mapping LiDAR. We also have uh, a few full waveform systems out there that don't have this, this hardware and firmware pulse detector, but actually record the entire returning waveform. Um, and this gives you a lot more information about what's out there in the world um, and avoids some problems with pulse detectors, but requires um, a, a, a more complicated instrument and a lot more work in dealing with the data because you've got to have better amplifiers, you've got to move a lot more data across the instrument um, from the detector to where you store it on the plane. Uh, you've got to have a bigger hard drive and then a whole lot more computer power because one zot of the laser is all of a sudden not maybe three or four or one XYZ triplet plus intensity, but it may be many kilobytes describing a waveform through time. To illustrate this a little bit, if we put the laser, that's not a laser, okay, um, up in the air, an airplane, look down at forest. Um, the laser beam can be focused or defocused. Um, sometimes it's a few inches wide, sometimes it's many feet wide, and especially if it's a wider beam, it may hit many targets on the way down. And going through open forest canopy, you may get multiple reflections inside the canopy and also reflection off the ground. And so the returning waveform um, may be something complex like this. And the further away it is, the more it is in time. If you look at the time from the time the light goes out, goes out and comes back, hits the first target, comes back, second target, so on. The actual returned light is a complex waveform a lot of information about where the foliage is in this canopy. The typical mapping instrument takes this and the first thing it does is simplifies it. It says there's a peak, there's a peak, there's a peak. And records just those single times or single distances. Um, but you can build instruments that, that recover the whole thing. And I'm not sure, but I would guess that the ratio of full waveform detectors to pulse detectors out there in the world in use right now is on the order of 1 to 100. Um, so we've got full waveform. We also have green, green LiDAR. Um, the 1064 nanometer laser that's used for most mapping LiDAR is used uh, because it's eye safe and because it's effective to power. We've got technology that turns electricity into light at that wavelength very efficiently. We don't need a big generator. We don't waste a lot of energy in, in the laser and, and melt the thing. Um, however, at that wavelength, water is opaque. You do not see through clouds. You do not see through puddles. Um, the water surface is whatever the water surface is, and beneath it, you know nothing. And it's nice sometimes to know a little more about what's underneath the water. And so you do a frequency doubler, which has the wavelength. You turn this into a 532 nanometer uh, pulse, which is in the green, and you can see through water. And if you've got a big enough laser and clear enough water, you can go as deep as 50 meters. If the water is cloudy or you can't pack that big a laser around in your aircraft, you don't go so deep. Um, you'll notice the, the big twin engine plane. And that's basically to haul the power to drive the laser and the power to drive the refrigerator that keeps the laser from melting. Um, <laughs> and we can make, again, beautiful bathymetric maps in areas of clear water. Um, we also have tripod-mounted LiDAR systems, where the scanner sits on a tripod, you, you put them in the trunk of your car, carry them in your arms. I think we have two of them on campus now that are available to students. Uh, they have the big advantage of being cheap. The whole system is $100,000 instead of hundreds of thousands of dollars, many hundreds of thousands. And with these, you can survey a hillside, a refinery, a tree, uh, a movie set. Um, here's an instrument. Survey people. And I should know which 
distinguished people these are in the university surveying community, but that's a, a UNAVCO meeting and we're imaging part of the audience. Um, LIDAR is remote sensing, but compared to most remote sensing, it's kind of unusual stuff. And these differences are ones that are subtle and worth thinking about because they trip us up. And I think many of the advances that can be made in using LIDAR will come from thinking about these differences, and how it's not ordinary remote sensing. Um, with ordinary remote sensing, say Landsat, um, typically we are taking a picture at one or many wavelengths. And we may or may not eliminate the target ourselves, be active or passive. But what we're measuring is then the reflectance at those wavelengths. And typically the sensor is like a camera sensor, is a panel of little things that light up when they get hit by a photon, or it's a push broom that's scanned across a, a, an image plane. And, and by the sensor design, we impose a raster geometry on the world that is something that's, you know, rectangular array of information. Um, and the raw data set is a raster. With LIDAR, the raw measurements are XYZ positions. They are not, um, you know, uh, brightness on, on the image plane of a camera. And the geometry is, is not the geometry of the sensor. It's the geometry that's the intersection of the scan pattern you choose and the target out there. And it's essentially random. You get the same results by sprinkling sand across a tabletop, just about. Um, the raw data set is a point cloud. It's not a raster. Or if you decide it's representing a surface, you interpret it, you call it a tin or a wireframe. Um, in a GIS environment, we almost always use LIDAR as a raster. And to do so uh, loses some of the essentials of the properties of the data. And in particular, it turns the noise structure upside down. With a LIDAR data set, you ask, you know, where is there a plane out there in the world? And we have the most data, even on planar surfaces, is where it's the most wrinkled because the, the measurement noise shows up. And we have the least data. I have a point here and one here and in here. In between, it's totally smooth. And so if you ask, how smooth is the Earth? The answer is it's really smooth for you and you know nothing. <laughs> and, and this is the problem of representing a point cloud as a raster. So you have to interpolate. Um, with Landsat or airborne infrared scanning or anything other more typical remote sensing, you need to correct the, the image geometry to the real world. You project from the sensor location onto a map of the world and, and, and fix for camera distortions, for atmospheric effects, and for topography. Um, with LiDAR data, there are no geometric corrections. I mean, the data are the shape of the world. That's all it is. Um, and then typically with much remote sensing, which is then a, a assortment of rasters at various wavelengths, People spend a lot of time developing allometric equations that somehow map that reflectance onto what they care about, whether it be tree height or iron content or, or, or percent urbanization or whatever. You go out and you do a ground survey and you measure things and you calibrate an equation that relates things you measure the thing you want to know about. Um, and with LiDAR data, typically there are no allometric equations. This is not true if you're measuring tree diameter, but if you're measuring hill slopes, I mean, the the shape is the characteristic of interest, and that's what you're getting directly. So there's not a problem there. Um, or if you're like me and you're a geologist and you're, you're mapping what's underneath the ground surface, the relationships between the shape of the ground and what's underneath it are, are well known. Braid planes are underlain by alluvium. I don't need an elementary equation to tell, my, tell me that or to convince my colleagues that I know that. And, and that makes this a very, very different kind of remote sensing. It means that I can make maps from LIDAR that I do not feel obliged to field check, uh, which is an interesting discussion with my colleagues. These data are so rich and so detailed and so wonderful, and we look at topography with this, that it's, they lead you to question what is topography and how do you think about it. And, and this is, I'm going to ask your forgiveness for getting a little bit philosophical here, but I think thinking about this thing might make you um, better GIS analysts and better earth scientists. Um, I sat down and wrote a definition of topography and what that means a while ago. And this is what I came up with. Um, topography is, is the 2.5D shape of the Earth's surface. You know, it's not flat, not 2D, it's, it's got wrinkles to it. And we used to depict it with contours. And, and now typically um, we depict it and analyze it as a raster, because that's what works in our GIS. And, and the way we use those rasters suggests to me that we assume topography is, more or less, continuous and differentiable. You can calculate a slope any place on it. 
Um, it's single value. You know, any place you go, you can get a value for it. You can't get two values or three. Topography has no overhangs in it, which is not true about the real world, but is true about our uh, raster models of it. it. It's a representation that simply doesn't allow for multiple values at a point. Um, we typically assume topography is mineral. You know, trees and duff aren't part of it. And I think in many cases, we assume topography is non-anthropogenic. Um, buildings are not part of it. And, and bridge approaches, we, we talk about whether they're part of topography or not. I want to look at some topography. Where's the ground surface out there? What is the ground surface? And if you're looking at this 24,000 scale, the stumps simply don't, and, and, and the down timber don't show up, and you need to think about this. With airborne LIDAR data, they do. And, and so are the stumps part of the landscape or not, part of the topography? And, and I suspect that if you're um, asking how many cubic meters of rock are underneath this hillside, is it worth developing a mine here? The stumps are not part of the topography. If you're asking where does the water flow, they may or may not be part of the topography depending on how permeable they are. Right? Holes the gophers have dug through them. And if you're asking can I drive across it, they definitely are. Ah, and back up here. So we have a, you know, let's suppose that, that we're, we're mining rock. And we build computer code that takes the stumps out of our point cloud. So we get a bare earth model that allows us to calculate how many cubic meters of rock there are in this whole set. We take that computer code and apply it to this landscape. Does it give us the right answer? What's the earth's surface there? And if you're calculating runoff, or drivability, what should the surface be? And I, I'm, I'm not, I, I do not mean to say that there's a right answer to these questions. There's a, there is, in all cases, a definition of topography we can refine and use everywhere. But rather that with enough detail, topography becomes many things, and we need to think about what we want before we define what the Earth's surface is, and then figure out how we're going to model our LiDAR data to extract that from it. What's topography here? And if you're an elk hunter wanting to know where you can drive to, or where you can drive to to pick up your elk carcass and haul it out so it won't fit on your back, that's the Earth's surface. If you're a hydrologist modeling the flow of water across the Earth's surface to find out where the streams come from and go to, that's topography. That's the surface there. And I've sat through more than one meeting of, of mappers and hydrographers where we all sat around and bemoaned the fact that we cannot make multi-value rasters to, to show both the, the culvert and the road on top of it. So that's a pretty common problem, a pretty important one. We think of topography as being non-anthropogenic. And driving the Trans-Canada Highway, looking at this, it's pretty clear that, no, those have been built. And if we're trying to you know, look at the evolution of this landscape through geologic time or through the Holocene, we take those out of our earth model. These are bare overpasses and very carefully constructed. So seen from above, bear's eyes, they look like they're natural. Um, and with that, I'm going to stop and turn this over to Dave, who's actually going to show you some lighter topography and, and let you share his excitement of how much it shows. Um, he got the good part of this. And, and I'm going to run away to Tacoma for the afternoon and then try to avoid saying things that get Dave into trouble. <laughs> anyway, thank you for your attention. <laughs>